This is our first lesson in Unit uh, 1718, Exponential and Logarithmic Derivatives. And as we go through this unit, we're going to be using the number e an awful lot. So what we want to do in this introductory lesson here is just understand um, why this number e um, is so uh, important to us in calculus and kind of what it means and why we use it. So what is e? As an introduction, e is a special number when it is used as the base for an exponential function. Now, an exponential function has the form f at x equals a to the x, where a is some positive number. So you've encountered exponential functions in before, things like f at x equals 2 to the power of x, f at x equals 10 to the power of x. And remember that these are different from the power law functions that we've been dealing with up until now. We've been looking at things like f at x equals x squared where you've got a base that is of our variable, in this case x, and uh, the, the constant or the number is up in the exponent. If we have an exponential function, the base is a constant and our variable is up in the exponent. And the question that's going to concern us in this unit, or one of the questions, is going to be how do we find the derivative of an exponential function? If we have some function f at x equals a to the x, where a is just some constant, how do we get the derivative? Well, to start looking at this, let's go back to first principles. And let's try to find the derivative using our first principles definition, limit as h goes to 0 of f at x plus h minus f at x, all divided by h. So if we apply this to the function f at x equals a over x, we'll have the limit as h goes to 0 a at x plus h, subbing in x plus h everywhere we see x, minus a to the x, all divided by h. And we want to be able to evaluate this limit. Um, so if we just try direct substitution and we sub in h equals to 0, we're going to be dividing by 0, so that's not going to work. So I think we want to start working on the, uh, the numerator of this limit and see if we can, if we can factor it. So we'll still have the limit as h goes to 0. But remember, if I've got a to the x plus h, I can rewrite that as a to the x times a to the h. If I'm multiplying powers of the same base, I add the exponents. So a to the x times a to the h is equal to a to the x plus h minus a to the x. Now I have something up in the numerator that I can factor. I can factor out the a to the x which is common to both of those terms, to get a to the x times a to the h minus 1. And still all over h. And in fact, this a to the x term, I can factor it out even further. This term right here does not have an h in it. So as I am changing the value of h to evaluate this limit as h goes to 0, like I'm making h smaller and smaller and smaller, the value of this term, a to the x, will not change because a to the x does not depend on h. So I can actually factor that right out of the limit because and bring it as a constant out in front because no matter what I do with h, that value of a to the x isn't going to change. So I can have a to the x times the limit as h goes to 0 of a to the h minus 1 all over h. How do we evaluate this limit? Well, we've kind of run into a roadblock. There's not much else we can do, and we still have the problem. We haven't been able to factor anything that cancels out. And if we tried direct substitution, we're still dividing by 0. So let's take a slightly different approach here. We'll, we'll keep this formula in mind, but We'll take a slightly different approach, and we'll try using tables to evaluate this limit. So let's check the value of limit as h goes to 0, a to the h minus 1 all over h, so that limit that we couldn't uh, evaluate on the previous page. And let's pick a couple of values of a, sub them in, and then in our table here, we'll make h smaller and smaller and smaller, so it approaches 0, and we'll look at what is happening to the value of this limit. And I shouldn't actually have this limit in here. I should, because I'm really just evaluating that expression. Um, so if a is equal to 2, I'm evaluating 2 to the h minus 1 over h. If a equals 3, I'm evaluating 3 to the h minus 1, all divided by h. So I tabulate these, and I can sort of see a trend in here. Um, 
is a is equal to 2, my numbers all seem to be heading towards a number like 0.693 maybe. And if a is equal to 3, uh, my numbers tend to be heading towards something like 1.0, maybe 9, something like that, somewhere in there. Okay. Now, what I can notice from here is that if I choose a equals 2, I get 0.693 for that limit. If I choose a equals 3, I get 1.09 for that limit. There should be a value in between. If I choose a value for a that is in between 2 and 3, my limit is going to evaluate to a number in between 0.693 and 0.109. And ideally, if I choose that number for a very, very carefully, I should get this limit to evaluate to be 1. So this suggests that the limit will equal 1 at a equals some number that is between 2 and 3. And this is the number that we refer to as e. e is approximately equal to 2.71828, so on and so on and so on. We can't say exactly what it uh, is equal to because it's an irrational number and that uh, those decimal places just keep going on and on and on and on and on. Okay? But if we choose our base a to be this number e, then that limit in our first principle's definition for our derivative will become the limit as h goes to 0 of this number e to the h minus 1 all divided by h. And this limit is going to equal 1 because we have chosen the value of e such that it is the number that is going to make this limit actually equal to 1. Now, why is this so helpful to us? Well, if e is the number such that that limit that we've been trying to evaluate is equal to 1, the function that we are trying to take the derivative of, okay, f at x equals a to the x, if a is equal to e, this number e, our function is now f at x equals e to the x. The derivative, f primed at x, is going to be Going back to the previous slide, we had e to the x times the limit as h goes to 0 of e to the h minus 1 all over h. That was our first principles uh, definition for the limit, or the expression we got applying the first principles definition. Well, we know what this limit evaluates to now. This whole thing is just going to be equal to 1. So our expression for the derivative is just going to be e to the x. So this is a little bit surprising. This tells us that the derivative of e to the x, or f at x equals e to the x, is e to the x. So the derivative and the original function are exactly the same. Another way of saying this is that the rate of change of our function is always equal to the value of the function. So the more we have of our whatever um, our function represents, the faster it is going to be changing, okay. the value of the function. Okay. So this is what we mean when we talk about exponential growth. Uh, the more we have of something, the quicker it is growing. The less we have, the less quickly it grows. Okay. So for this reason, because it makes the derivatives so easy to calculate, uh, e is sometimes called the natural base. Okay? Y equals e to the x would be uh, a function where we are using the natural base because the derivative is very simple to, to calculate here. Now, the inverse of an exponential function, you learned this back in, in the advanced functions, is a logarithmic function. So the inverse of y equals e to the x is y equals log to the base e of x. And we give this log to the base e a special name. We call it 
ln of x. Ln, of course, just means the natural logarithm. Why is it called the natural logarithm? Because we are using our natural base, base e. And what we're going to find um, as we go through this unit is that um, exponential functions and logarithmic functions where we're using the natural base or base e are much easier to work with and easier to find the derivatives of than functions where we are using a base that is not the natural base or is not base e. 